Let's learn about single replacement reactions. Get out your science notebook. Here's the essential question right at the top of your page. How do you determine the products of a single replacement reaction? Remember, single replacement reactions are just one of five different types of chemical reactions. We've talked about a few more in depthly, and we're going to do the same with single replacement reactions. Here is a good visual of what a single replacement reaction looks like. You might want to pause the video and draw this picture. Now notice, we're going to start with a compound and an element, and then there are two different results that could occur. These results depend on the charge of the single element right here. If it's negatively charged, it's going to go to this top row. If it's positively charged, it's going to go to this bottom row. So single replacement reaction is just where one element replaces a similarly charged element in a compound. So you see this purple circle here is going to replace this green square if it's negatively charged because it's a negative replacing a negative. Or if the purple circle is positively charged, it's going to replace the blue square because it is similarly positively charged. So we need to know the charges of our elements in order to know what they're going to do, or at least the predictable charges of the elements. Now, there are two types of single replacement reactions we should be aware of. One type is where we have a metal element. So that element, if it's a metal, it's going to react in one way. And that is a replacement of a positive metal by a more reactive metal from the activity series. And we're going to talk about what an activity series is in just a few moments. The other type of single replacement reaction is where the single element is a halogen element. That's a non-metal. So it's a replacement of a negative halogen, which is a non-metal, by another. All right, so what is the activity series? This is found on your periodic table, and it's a list of metals from most reactive on the top to least reactive on the bottom, at least the one that's on our periodic table. Now, the reason this activity series is important is because in a single replacement reaction, only metals on the top or the, the more metal reactive the more reactive metals will replace the least reactive metals, but it won't happen the other way around. So if the metals on the top will replace the ones on the bottom, but the ones on the bottom will not replace the ones near the top. So let's take a look at that with a couple of examples. I'm going to go through a single replacement reaction. This is the one where there is a metal element. Take a look at this teacher example up here at the top, and then I'm going to have you guys pause the video and try the student practice on the bottom. So up here we have aluminum and iron 2 nitrate. Now, in order to, for single replacement reactions to work, we need to really understand their charges. One thing I want to point out, Elements by themselves do not have a charge. I know we've written charges on our periodic table and we've designated the charges, but remember, those are predictable charges of elements. Those aren't the permanent charges of elements. Aluminum by itself, just floating around, is going to have no charge. Now over here, iron and nitrate each have a charge of positive 2 and negative 1 respectively, which is why we have two nitrates to counteract the one iron. Now, when those do a single replacement reaction, I'm going to take a look here. Aluminum is above iron on the periodic table, so it's going to replace that iron. And so aluminum is going to get attached to nitrate. Now, when they do attach, we need to respect their new charges. Aluminum becomes positive 3 because it wants to attach to nitrate. And nitrate is still a negative 1 because that's its, that's its predictable charge. And so here is aluminum, nit aluminum nitrate. And then iron goes off by itself. And iron has no charge because it's now alone and it's not attached to anything. All right, see if you can figure out this next one by yourself. This is calcium sulfate and lead. Pause the video and see if you can determine the products of this reaction. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go over the answer to this. Hopefully you took a chance to pause the video and try it yourself. Kind of a tricky one because in this one, there's no reaction. The reason there's no reaction is because of that activity series. Calcium is more reactive than lead, so it's not going to give up its place in this dance. All right, I do have one more practice for you. Let's see if you can figure this one out. This is calcium sulfate, but this time it's potassium that's going to try to single replace it. All right, hopefully you took a chance to try this one. Potassium does single replace calcium because potassium is more reactive in the activity series. Now remember, we need to worry about charges here, so let's take a look at calcium and sulfate. Calcium is a positive 2, sulfate's a minus 2. Potassium technically doesn't have a charge because it's by itself, but if we do look on the periodic table, we do know that its predictable charge will be positive 1 when it makes a uh, an attachment to another element or a substance.
So knowing that, we're going to go through a single replacement reaction. It's going to be potassium sulfate, and potassium has a little subscript of 2 because the charges are plus 1 and minus 2. And then calcium does not have a charge. It goes off by itself in this, in this formula. It becomes the single element. Now, one thing we need to do is make sure we balance this reaction. I see that most things are balanced except for this potassium. There seems to be an imbalance. So I'm going to put a, a, a coefficient of 2 in front of potassium in the reactant side to balance out the two potassiums in the product side. All right, let's take a look at the other type of single replacement reaction, the one where there's a halogen element. So here we have a chlorine. This is a halogen. It's in the 18th column on the, or it's in the 17th column on the periodic table. All of these gases are halogens and chlorine has a little two here because it's a diatomic element. Many of the halogens are diatomic. Now, knowing that be, no, because chlorine's alone, it doesn't have a charge. Now over here is potassium bromide and potassium is connected to bromine with a one-on-one -on -one relationship because it's a positive one and a negative one. Those are gonna go through a single replacement reaction. In fact, we don't need to worry about this activity series because these aren't metals that are replacing each other. These are non-metals. So we're gonna ignore the activity series for halogens. So chlorine is gonna replace change places with bromine in a single replacement reaction. Now chlorine's predictable charge is negative one. So potassium and chlorine easily go together in a one-to-one -one relationship. Bromine is gonna go off by itself, but we need to remember that bromine and many of the halogens are diatomic. So I need to write a little subscript two right there to make sure to account for the fact that it's one of those special seven diatomic elements. And then we balance it using coefficients. All right, pause the video and see if you can figure out this student practice by yourself. Here we have gallium iodide and fluorine. All right, did you pause the video? I hope so. This one's not as tricky. They definitely do single replace each other because we can ignore the activity series here, but we should know the charges of each of the elements. Gallium is a positive three and iodine is a negative one, which is why there's a subscript of three next to iodine. Fluorine is technically no charge being a single element by itself or a, a, an elemental form of a pure substance. But we do know that fluorine will predictably become negative one when it bonds. So Let's put the new partners together. Here we have gallium fluoride. Again, that's a positive three and a negative one. And then iodine goes off by itself and there's no charge because it's a single element pure substance. But iodine is diatomic, so we have to put a little two there. The last thing we need to do is balance this reaction by adding coefficients up in the front. Not too bad as long as we realize that we need to have the same numbers of atoms and types of atoms on both sides of the reaction. All right, that leads us to the end of their notes. This is a great time to review, maybe even go back and highlight key terms and ideas. Ponder and ask questions. If you're struggling, don't struggle in silence. Go and write those questions down and go ask your instructor or somebody in the class. And then summarize by answer that essential question you have at the top. See if you can answer that in a deep level, maybe even providing your own examples. Good luck.